Hi guys, welcome to part two for how to travel to bet. I may have changed my top, but I'm definitely just recording these videos back to back. Anyways, if you haven't seen part one, part one is all about visas, how to get to Tibet, where to stay, how to book your tour, when to visit. I think I talked about transportation. Check out part one, I'll link it above, and then come back for part two, because in part two, I'm gonna talk about everything else you need to know to travel to Tibet. Yeah, let's just jump into it. Again, the tour company that I chose was Explore Tibet. Links, lots of links will be in the description box. Food options. So generally on your tour, what will happen every day is your tour guide will be like, what do you want to eat? Offer you a list of places that you can choose from. There will be Western options and there'll be local food options. You can pre-book restaurants in advance and prepay for them. This is depending on if you're customizing your itinerary, which I talked more about customizing itineraries in uh, part one. What Jordan and I did was just pick the day of and we pretty much stuck to local restaurants. I think we even like asked our guide no, we did ask our guy. We're like, can you please take us to like the hole in the wall Tibetan restaurants? We want authentic Tibetan food. And that's where we ate all the time. And that's also the cheapest. In terms of cost, uh, in the bigger cities, it costs anywhere from like 50 to 100 RMB per day for lunch and dinner. When you get outside of the cities and the more remote towns and villages, it could cost anywhere from like, I'd say 30 to 60 RMB per day for lunch and dinner. And if you want to know just like an average amount of pocket money, you might want to have extra. Obviously it depends on your spending habits, but maybe plan for an extra, I don't know, 50 to 100 RMB per day. Vegetarians. Good news for you vegetarians is that Buddhism is strongly practiced in Tibet and so they actually prefer to be vegetarian and so there will be loads of options for you to choose from. You do not have to worry at all if you are a vegetarian. Even in the small remote towns and villages, there will be vegetarian options. Now vegans, <laughs> I have recently become a vegan. <laughs> this, uh, not gonna lie, this is gonna be pretty darn difficult if you're vegan. I don't know if you're one of those vegans who like when I travel, I'm vegetarian. That's kind of the route I'm trying to take because I am vegan now ish but uh it does get a little bit difficult especially when you're traveling it's possible but I would recommend going and buying some foods from like the supermarket in Lhasa in one of the big cities they'll have like big supermarkets and malls with a lot of imported goods yeah I would go and stock up on whatever it is you need water don't drink it don't like it don't I don't know why I said don't like it wait I don't where am I going with this don't touch the tap water don't drink the tap water, don't boil the tap water, and drink that boiled tap water. It's not clean. Don't brush your teeth with the tap water, although a lot of people do this. Actually, Jordan does this and has no issues. I have had issues of this. Just don't risk it. Altitude sickness. This is a super important subject to talk about because a lot of tourists suffer from this and it can be very dangerous if not handled uh, properly. What is altitude sickness? In a nutshell, it's essentially your blood not getting enough oxygen. And so when your blood doesn't get enough oxygen, this can lead to fatigue, dizziness, lightheadedness, nausea, vomiting, fevers, a rapid pulse, loss of appetite, and even in some serious cases, you could be spitting up blood. So we don't want any of this, but likely somebody in your group, if not you, are going to suffer from altitude sickness or at least feel the change in altitude. It does affect everybody differently. Uh, for example, between Jordan and I, I didn't really have any issues. I definitely felt the altitude, but I didn't get sick. Whereas Jordan was on the oxygen tank a few times and had a lot of problems, especially when we got to Everest Base Camp. I can tell you every single person is going to feel it at Everest Base Camp. They might not get sick from it, but we're all gonna feel that difference in height. I mean, it's like 5,200 meters or something like that. Like, whew. It's high. Your tour company will likely be very educated on this and know what to do if you're having any issues, know what medications to give you, and they'll also probably have an ox uh, oxygen tank to give you in more serious cases. Best advice I can give you is number one, don't do anything too strenuous in those first few days and the first few days leading up to it. You don't want to put your body in too much stress because when you get to altitude, you're gonna be a lot more tired than normal. Like walking upstairs is gonna feel a lot more effort than if you were back wherever you came from. If you fly into Lhasa, Lhasa is already right at 12,000 feet. So it's already pretty darn high. And some people will end up getting the oxygen tank like that first night, which is what happened with us if you saw my videos. Don't feel bad if this does happen to you. Don't think like, oh, you're just super weak or whatever. Like this does happen. There are some medications you can take for altitude sickness and I definitely would encourage that, but you cannot buy those medications in Tibet. So make sure you bring them in, you get them beforehand. I personally think that people with higher fitness level and more healthy eating habits might be more able to handle the 
altitude better than others who are a bit weaker. So my advice in that situation, maybe do a few small hikes or cardio activities just to get your body used to having less oxygen. Water. I can't stress this enough how important it is to drink a lot of water. You should be drinking like three to four times more than what you normally would drink in your regular everyday life. You need to be drinking like four to six liters of water. You need to be having a high calorie diet. Yes, you are going to be pissing like every five seconds. It's going to get annoying, but the alternative of being super sick, I don't think you want that. I would also kind of try to refrain from having so much coffee and teas with caffeine that are going to dehydrate you because then you're going to have to drink even more water to compensate for that. I also found that drinking lemon ginger tea really helped me. I don't know if that's just in my brain, but I had those every single day. And like I said, I didn't have any issues with altitude when I was there. Also uh, know that electronic batteries tend to drain really quickly in higher altitude. So just be prepared that your phone or your cameras might die quicker and you have to charge them more often when you're getting higher up. What to bring. So your tour company likely has a list of things that you should bring and it's all gonna be different depending on that specific tour that you do because it's gonna be different activities and different places with different weather. But generally speaking, even in like the warmer climates, you should be bringing warm clothes. I know when we went, like it would be sunny during the day, but freezing at night. I would also recommend bringing a lot of layers because I found that the weather was kind of changing a lot. Definitely bring hiking boots or tennis shoes, good walking shoes. Bring um, sunscreen. Sunscreen is so important because you are high up and you are exposed to very strong sun, so this can be really bad for your skin. I would also bring sunglasses and hat. Bring things like lotions, like a good quality lotion because it can be quite dry. Bring chapstick. Tissues, bring tissues. Especially when you're gonna get more off the beaten path in like the more remote villages, definitely find yourself going in a squatty if you haven't already experienced that or going outside. Pretty much like a 90% chance there's no toilet paper. Also, a lot of the restaurants I found didn't even have uh, napkins. Altitude sickness pills, any medications like ibuprofen or things for like stomach problems, whatever it is that you generally like to bring for traveling just in case you get sick or you know you suffer from this. I always like to take probiotics. Now, especially that I'm vegan, I take probiotics actually every single day, but probiotics is good for the stomach and dealing with bacteria. You can get probiotics naturally in uh, yogurt. Lastly, I would bring in some electrolytes. You can get those in like powdered pill form that would dissolve in water just to help you stay hydrated because sometimes you can be drinking loads of water, but it's not actually retaining in your body. And so you need electrolytes to kind of hold it in instead of just pissing it all out. Currency, let's talk about money. So in Tibet, they use the Chinese RMB, also called Yuan, also called Kwai. You cannot use any other foreign currency. You can only use that. You can go to the Bank of China and like exchange uh, traveler's checks in exchange for cash. You can go to ATM, pull out cash. I feel like I'm just saying cash a lot really quickly. <laughs> this is more though in the bigger cities. Don't expect to find an ATM when you get to like these small remote villages. Also available is WeChat and Alipay. WeChat is definitely like the most broadly used. So you can definitely be using that even in the more remote areas, like in restaurants, you could be using WeChat. If you don't know what WeChat and Alipay is, just don't worry about it. You don't need to know. Tipping. Do you tip in Tibet? No. No, you do not. Except your tour company guides. So you are likely going to have a driver and a guide. Maybe you have multiple guides. I don't know how your tour company does it. But you need to tip the guide and the driver usually around 50 to 100 RMB per day per person. Don't stiff your guides like this is how they make majority of their income. Internet and phone access. So um, it depends where you're staying, but definitely like the higher end hotels, like we had internet access, pretty much all of them and phone access. It depends on your tour, but I know like the private tours with Export Bet, they will actually offer you an option for a free SIM card and phone that you can use during the tour, obviously you don't take it when you leave. You can also just like get phone service in mainland China before you come in if you want. Or you can ask your tour guide to help you get a SIM card if that's what you really want. I mean, I don't really think you need it. Like just use the free internet and stuff when you get to your accommodation. But if you desperately want it, you can have that as an option. In terms of getting in contact with uh, friends and family from home or accessing those banned sites that you want to be able to access, if you don't already know, you cannot access things like Facebook, Instagram, YouTube, your Gmail, anything Google, unless you have a VPN. And I have mentioned VPN so many times in my videos because it's so important. Basically, it gives you the ability to access 
all those banned sites. And as I've already mentioned so many times, but I'm gonna mention it again, I use ExpressVPN. Jordan also uses ExpressVPN. I have a lot of friends who use ExpressVPN, and I actually have a discount link for you guys. It's only for Where's Poppy followers, so if you wanted to sign up under my link, it'll be in the description box, and what it does, it gives you three months free with a one-year subscription to ExpressVPN. Yes, there are a, there's available one-month free trial. You can do that option, but, um, I would still just get a VPN in general. I use my VPN all the time, everywhere I go. It doesn't matter what country I'm in. Especially when you're going and borrowing internet from like restaurants and cafes traveling, like your stuff is so easily hackable. Like I don't think you realize that. And if you're wondering like, oh, how did I, somebody steal my money out of my bank account? It's probably because of that. But if you're using a VPN all the time when you're traveling, like it's secure, they cannot hack anything. Also, it gives you access to things that you can't normally access. For example, Australia, like Australia doesn't have the best Netflix options, to be honest with you. So I will often change my location to say I'm like back in Los Angeles or something so that I can watch like the show Friends. Friends is not available in Australia on Australian Netflix. So you just change it and then it works. And also important to note, you have to have this downloaded and already working before you go. Travel insurance. So all Tibetan tour companies are required to have a basic business liability insurance, but this doesn't really cover you medically. You still want to be coming to Tibet with your own insurance or however you have it set up with your healthcare provider back home. Because I travel a lot, I personally use Nomad Insurance. It's called Safety Wing. I'll also put a link in the description box to that. It works for me because I travel so much and I'm not actually insured in my home country because I haven't lived there in years and I'm rarely there. I pay $37 a month and then I'm medically insured and have regular travel insurance through them as well for things getting lost or damaged or whatever. Everywhere else I go besides my home country. If I go to my home country in the US, I'm only insured for like 15 days and then it resets like every 90 days or something like that. But good thing to have, you never know what's gonna happen. I know a lot of people, they just risk it. I used to be one of them. <laughs> you can't plan when something's gonna go wrong. Set yourself up for success and get insurance. Is it safe to travel to Tibet? And is it safe specifically as a female solo traveler? Cause I've gotten a few questions about this and obviously I'm a solo female traveler. <laughs> yes, short answer, yes. Do you wanna know why? Because you are never going to be alone. You are going there on a tour. Remember, you're not allowed to go freely and roam around Tibet on your own. So you will be safe because the tour company is liable for you and has to look after you. If you are in places like Lhasa, um, you do have the option to just go off on your own without your guide and explore the city. I did find it fairly safe. Like I didn't have any issues. I didn't feel unsafe at all. I didn't ever go out at night. I think I was with Jordan for the most part. Maybe I stepped up myself a little bit. I'm not really sure. Yeah, I felt like it was very safe. I don't think you have anything to worry about. Language barrier. Yeah, um, if you don't speak the local language, yes, there will be a language barrier, but will you have issues? No, why? Because you're on a tour and your tour guide is going to likely speak the language that you've selected him to speak. You shouldn't have an issue with this because you could just ask your guide or tour company to help translate. But if you are walking the streets by yourself, just get a translating app. There are many, I use Microsoft Translator. I've said that a few times in the past. Drones, can you fly your drone in Tibet? Yes, you can, not everywhere. You usually can't fly them in the bigger cities like Lhasa and definitely not around like military camps. Like the same rules apply, just ask your tour guide they should be educated on where you can and cannot fly. Also important to know this is you have to register your drone in China, otherwise it literally will not take flight. In order to register your drone in China, you need to have a Chinese phone number and then register the drone under that number. I'll put a link in the description box for how to register your drone so you can do that on your own. Otherwise, Jordan and I made uh, our guides, which I'll also put links on how to travel China. Um, you can check out, we talk, I talk all about drones in that situation because I have had issues where my drone wasn't taking off. Etiquette and taboos. Now, this is really important because you don't wanna be disrespecting a culture or a group of people. So let's start with clothing. In Tibet, they are pretty conservative from the Western perspective. Basically should not be wearing anything besides long pants or girls, long skirts. 
shouldn't be really showing any skin definitely no cleavage just want to be respectful in that sense especially when you go in the more remote areas if you do wear shorts you're gonna get some pretty strange if not dirty looks uh, especially if you go into the monasteries you need to be covered up I know this could be kind of frustrating because obviously we have different styles or and maybe what you wear in your home country is acceptable but it's not here I know I personally suffer from this because I travel so often that I only have a limited amount of wardrobe in my bag to start with and it's usually stuff for summer I guess more revealing because where I'm from it's not considered inappropriate but for Tibet you need to suck it up and just go buy some new clothes taking photographs this is a big one to pay close attention to because you can't be taking photographs or videos of everything that you want. You have to be very careful not to take photographs or videos of sensitive things like police, border checkpoints, military, and so on. Also, just being careful of taking any photos of people. You really should ask their permission to do so. And if you do, like maybe even offer them money. Don't just assume though that if you offer them money to take their photo that that's considered respectful. It still could be disrespectful to them. Definitely don't take photos or videos inside monasteries. Your guide will tell you this. He'll prep you before every time. If you decide to ignore that, you can say goodbye to your device like it'll be gone before you even can say to bed <laughs> bargaining bargaining is massive here uh definitely you can bargain don't think that when someone's like yeah this chapstick is a thousand rmb that you have to pay a thousand rmb no man like pay freaking five rmb you can ask for less and it's definitely encouraged it's all a game honestly if you don't know the game that you need to learn so definitely you are allowed to bargain all right that's it for this two-part series of how to travel to bet i hope that you found this information helpful if you did please tell me what you did find helpful and also if you have more questions if i didn't cover whatever i missed in part one and part two please leave it in the comment section so that i can either answer it or somebody in the comment section will come and help you out, I'm sure. Please do share this video and part one as well. If you enjoy my content, or I guess me, <laughs> then make sure to stay tuned for more of my adventures. I really do my best to focus as much as I can on people and culture when I'm traveling. If that's something you're interested in, then stay tuned for more adventures because I've got a lot more coming up. You can also follow me on any of my Instagram pages. I have two, I have one for travel and one for fitness. Also have a Patreon if you want to support me and get extra content there. And also if you just want to donate monetarily, you can also just donate to my PayPal. Um, got loads of stuff. Got a website, course about how to travel China. Yeah, you can check out everything to do with Where's Poppy. And yeah, I will see you guys on the next adventure. Bye. Oh, here we go again, yeah.